How many more lies? Now, uh, you know, I'm not trained in this, right? I have to base it on other things, but I kind of have a way where I can decipher when Casey Anthony is lying. And, and I've deduced that it's usually when her lips are moving. You see her lips moving, she's very likely lying about something. It was unreal. I'm not trained in all this, but tonight I've got the experts who can talk all about body language, what, what, what you actually see and hear when someone is speaking, what they're really saying. Let me introduce them. In Orlando, Florida, of course in Orlando, Florida, jury consultant, human behavior expert, Susan Constantine, who was with, with me years ago down there when all of this was happening. Great to see you in Loveland, Colorado. Statement analysis expert, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer. Great to see you. And in Bradenton, Florida, voice stress analysis expert, Jerry Crotty. Great to have everyone here. So um, what we're gonna do together is take a look at a little piece of what I experienced last night and then have everyone give us a little bit of analysis of what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Um, and I know you all watched the entire thing like I did, so um, you can take your comments beyond that. But let's start with this. In this three-part series, Casey Anthony says she went to sleep with her daughter next to her, then being awoken by her father, asking her where Kaylee was. Casey says she searched the house in the yard before seeing her father holding Kaylee in his arms. <laughs> I can see him standing there with her in his arms and hand her to me and telling me that it's my fault, that I did that, that I caused that. And I just collapsed with her in my arms. She was heavy, she was cold. As I'm sitting there with her on my lap, just hysterical, but just staring at her, not knowing what to do. He takes her from me, and he immediately softens his tone and tells me it's going to be okay, that she was going to be okay. That's what he said to me. And I don't know how long I sat outside. I don't know where he went. He took her from me and he walked away. And she continues to talk about, for folks who haven't seen it yet, that she believed Kaylee was alive. And during those 31 days that we've always talked about, her and her dad were meeting up and he was telling her what to do, what to say, how to act, all of that. Unreal. All right, let's get some analysis and reaction. Susan Constantine, go ahead. Yeah, so the first thing I noticed is, and this has been very consistent throughout the, well, all three of those documentaries, is that there's this enormous amount of anger, scorn, contempt, disgust was the big one. You know, when you see the nose scrunching up like this, that's that triad of emotion is often linked with deception. So when we see this, when she's talking about, when she's talking about our daughter, she's got this disgust. I want to share something with you. When you and I were in that courtroom that day, right? We listened to the entire trial. But when she was talking about when the human decomposition, when they opened up the trunk and that there was this odor of human decomposition, right then, Casey Anthony showed disgust. So she's doing the same thing here again. So when, like when she reenacted that, that uh, moment when she could actually remember what that odor smelled like, she saw the disgust. This disgust is more about her anger, her hostility that is vented towards her father. That's where that is coming from. And she's doing that because that's what fuels her annoyance. So it's a form of status and she's trying to position herself. So the more she tries to position her status and try to appear truthful, she then ups her game and that anger, disgust and contempt and that triad is always considered deceptive. There was a ton of anger that I was feeling. Lieutenant uh, Robert Schaefer, um, your thoughts? 
Well, as I look at that, uh, oh, by the way, it's good to see. Hey, um, uh, as I look at that clip, uh, one thing really stands out to me. What I do is look at language. Uh, the story somebody has to tell and the way they put that story together to tell me whether it's a truthful thought process or deceptive. And that portion of her, uh, her story is told uh, with a focus on emotion. It's she she doesn't give a factual account and, this, and there's facts involved but but her, her goal there is to convey emotion which is kind of related to what uh, Susan was saying and uh, when a person recalls from memory and that would be a, a truthful statement that's not necessarily what they do they want people to understand what happened she's more concerned about conveying emotion how she felt how she was made to feel rather than the facts of what actually happened so that would be a symptomatic of a, a suspicion of deception. Jerry Crotty, your thoughts? Well, I get to uh, analyze what she says through a uh, computer program. And what I'm looking for is that conflict in the brain. Uh, when people are being truthful, there is no real conflict. It just comes out very smoothly. Uh, and it's uh, spontaneous and everything else. And so when I analyze a lot of her statements, uh, as you will see, if, uh, it, that you will see this conflict on, on her uh, through most of her testimony that she gave during her documentary. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just fascinating to watch, just like you said. What, what do you uh, mean by you, conflict? Uh, explain that just a little bit. Okay, so you have two sides of the brain. You got, and I'll just kind of like uh, make it easy. Uh, you have two sides of the brain. You got one side of the brain that's, let's just call it pure. Uh, it basically runs your heart, it runs your lungs, it does everything it's supposed to do, and it does it all automatically. And then you got the other side of the brain that's a little bit devious, and that's the side where deception comes from. And when a person decides to lie, there is this reaction in the brain. One side says do it, the other side says we're not doing this today. But unfortunately, you can push it through, and what ends up happening is that stress, that reaction, that conflict that occurs in the brain, it goes out throughout the body, and that's what everybody's looking at here. Uh, I get to see it through the voice, and Susan gets to see it in the body, and Bob gets to see it through their language, what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, that's, it's really important the way that we do these things, and uh, it's just, this is very fascinating to me what she said. Now, Susan, one thing that I, that I noticed just looking at, you know, she was, there was a lot of stuff going on in her face. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna, yeah. I noticed a lot of times she would finish saying something and kind of do a, a little thing with a little lip. I would see that a lot. It would be like at the end of a thought or something, and then it would stop, and it'd be, and then the camera would stay on her for a second, and it would started jumping out at me. The other thing mm -hmm. is this furrowed little brow in the middle here. Like sometimes it was like deeper than the Grand Canyon mm -hmm. in there. What what do those things mean? Any what do they mean if anything? You see you see it sort of in the first yeah. two here, uh, but I saw it right. even deeper. Yeah, so anytime you see an asymmetrical movement, especially with a mouth, that's associated with contempt. But what she does is it's more like almost uncertainty. You know, it's almost where she bites the side of her mouth. It happens right after a statement. So when she says something and then she can hold it for a certain amount of time, then the duping delight pops out. You see the side movement, that the, the asymmetrical movement, which is doubting the words that she said. So she doesn't believe it, but she's trying to pull it off. Right, so that cognitive load, she's it's building up and then it releases right at the very end. And that's also what you see in the furrowed eyebrows. Furrowed eyebrows are when somebody's under a lot of tension, right? They're angry and they're tension and her eyebrows are coming down, right? So when you're upset about something, you're sad, which is what I would expect to see, her eyebrows would turn up, but it furrows in. So she's constantly in this state of anger and contempt, this triad of emotions, which is fueled by her inter-hostility. So that side contempt is partly, is a, is, a, is a more of a complex emotion. So it's contempt, moral superiority, but it's also self-doubt. And she's trying to convince rather than convey, and it actually comes out in doobie delight on the side of her face. Uh, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, I want you to take a listen. This is Ho Jose Baez, that uh, opening statement that I referenced. Here's a piece of it. Uh, because it, to me it was significant because this was the game changer in the trial. It was powerful. Uh, it turned everything on its head. Let's listen to it one more time. 
How in the world can a mother wait 30 days before ever reporting her child missing? It's insane. It's bizarre. Something's just not right about that. Well, the answer is actually relatively simple. She never was missing. Kaylee Anthony died on June 16, 2008, when she drowned in her family's swimming pool. You're going to hear that Kaylee loved to swim, and Kaylee could get out of the house very easily, and it escalated. Uh, a couple of things pretty amazing in that clip, because in the docuseries, she says she had no idea what he was going to say, and she didn't know that he was going get to get, get into everything that he did. Uh, but, Lieutenant, let me ask you, here, Jose Baez, very specific in, in what happened. Uh, that story has changed, I know, as a lawyer. Um, you cannot just say whatever you want in your opening statement. It has to be based upon something. The only person who could tell him what happened would be Casey Anthony. Um, how do you account for the, the statement seemingly changing from what her attorney said to what she said? Well, I think that uh, it's been my impression, uh, based on the way he states things, that he probably wasn't sure right up to the last minute, or at least right the final hour, exactly what the defense was going to be. And so uh, what I understand about some other things that I've seen, that uh, she was not clear with him exactly what that was going to be, and that was uh, kind of a final uh, decision that they just had to run with. I think they felt that they, they could build a good enough case with that, with the information that they had. But uh, he absolutely depends on her to decide what that defense is going to be. And uh, I noticed that one thing about that is that he stated that he described her in the third person. He says, what would cause a mother to do this? And although she's is, you know, as though she's not really a person, he wasn't specific to her. So what would cause a mother to wait 30 days? So he wasn't specific to uh, Casey. Um, and so there's, uh, that's what we call a lack of commitment. Uh, that's fascinating. Talking about somebody in the Talking about somebody in the third person, there's a lack of commitment Absolutely. that shows that he doesn't even really believe, if you want to put it that way, what she had to say. Unbelievable. All right, Susan, Constantine, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, Jerry Crotty staying with us. Uh, we've got more analysis, especially when we get to the accusations against George Anthony. That is next. Okay, let me bring back in my experts, Susan Constantine, human behavior expert, jury consultant, Lieutenant Robert Schaefer, statement analysis expert, Jerry Crotty, voice stress analyst expert. We just heard her there accuse her brother and her father. Jerry, I'll start with you. Do you hear that same conflict during this part of, of her statements? Yes, I was able to run this through the uh, computer to see what came up and uh, to kind of give you an idea what these things look like. Uh, if there's no stress associated with the word, looks like this Christmas tree over my shoulder here. Uh, it's, it's just a pointy top, looks just like a Christmas tree. If it looks anything other than a Christmas tree, that's when we start to kind of pay attention to it. Uh, this statement that she made was not very many Christmas trees. There was a lot of stress associated with it. And uh, I want to say that this is a different type of stress. This isn't from you know, recalling incidents or anything like that. I have examined multiple individuals, uh, probably close to a thousand individuals. And uh, if they have nothing to worry about what they're saying, that information should, f should flow freely from the individual and there should be no stress created from it. And so, yes, I did see some uh, rather interesting output on that one. Susan, your thoughts about what we, we just saw? Well, one of the things that stood out to me was her, there was no eye movement. You know, when we think about Clinton, when he was accusing Monica Lewinsky, he, she, her eyes never moved. You would expect for her to, when she's recalling something, your eyes are going to shift. It's going to go back into memory and, and, and replay the tape. And, and uh, Jerry really talks to that really well in our training class. Uh, but that was one of the major things that I saw. Again, anger. So you would have expected her to feel shameful, embarrassed, but her eyes were very fixated. There was no rapid eye blinking, which you should have seen because that was a very stressful situation. That would have been more concerning than the staring eyes. All right, we're out of time for tonight, but I just want to go around the horn one time uh, really quickly. 
At the end of the day, after watching everything and analyzing it, um, zero to ten, ten being the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, zero being nothing but lies, what's your number, Susan? 80% of it is lies, 20% truth. Lieutenant Robert Schaefer. Yeah, I would have said 70-30. 70-30. Jerry? I'm going to give you one better than that. I was waiting for her pants to burst into flames. So that's very much <laughs> pants very much it. on fire. Thank you all so much. Appreciate your time, your insight, your expertise. Uh, great, great job, everyone. Thank you so much.